life. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, I think it's okay. It says that there is eight plus hours, so hopefully this should be good. So I'll just start over again. Okay. Hello, my beautiful light workers, and thank you for joining me on Soul to Soul. So today I have Sandra Ingerman, who is an author of eight wonderful books. She's a healer and she's also <clears throat> a shamanic practitioner. And I'm so excited to have you here with me today, Sandra. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Layla. Um, so I'd like to begin by asking you to share a bit of your story. I think stories are so powerful. I love stories and they're so inspirational. So if you could just share how you got started um, with how you got introduced to shamanic practices, sure. what is shamanism, who is a shaman, that would be uh, wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in a um, very traditional fam family, <clears throat> real New York family like people see on, on TV. And I was always a, a very spiritual child. I, talk to trees and, and um, sang to the birds and sang to the moon, loved to go outside and sing to the moon. And uh, so I, I always had this um, spiritual awareness that there was more than just what we see and feel on the tangible uh, world. And, and I was always very um, interested in the invisible realms. And when I was seven, I got hit by lightning, by a uh, stray lightning bolt. And I <clears throat> was thrown and knocked unconscious, and I came back and said, Mommy, I died. Mommy, I died. She said, No, you didn't. But um, as I grew older, I learned that that is one of the initiations into shamanism. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it was a destiny I was born with or whether it was being hit by lightning, you know, I'm not really sure. I grew up in the 1960s and it was during um, a very tur turbulent time um, because there were a lot of us who didn't support the Vietnam War and so there was a lot of soul searching that was going on. Of course, we welcomed home all the vets, but didn't support the war itself. And so I really turned to alternatives. I was part of the whole drug culture. And I kept on ex feeling that there was something more to life than watching people live in the status quo in New York, getting up, going to work, working jobs they didn't like feeling separate from each other, and I started really seeking. And so I moved to San Francisco, I moved to the Haight-Ashbury um, when I was about um, 18 years old, and started um, just seeking an alternative uh, lifestyle. And then I experienced two more near-death experiences. I drowned uh, while I was in Mexico oh and accidentally drove my car off a cliff um, while I was in Oregon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, you know, all of those kept expanding my state of consciousness as well as the alternative lifestyle that I was living. And <clears throat> so um, I got my BA in marine biology and then I ended up kind of long story, I'll shorten this, to going for my master's in counseling psychology at a private graduate school in San Francisco. And while I was going to the graduate school, um, an anthropologist by the name of Michael Harner came out to teach a beginning course on shamanic journeying. I signed up thinking I was just getting two easy units because I was working 60 hours a week to put myself through school. And when I learned how to journey shamanically, when I had my very first journey, I had such a powerful experience meeting uh, a helping spirit who is still guiding me today that was on Halloween of 1980, so it was over 30 years ago. Wow. And what um, shamanism really did for me was I had a spiritual awakening, but I didn't have a practice to really work with um, being able to live a spiritual practice in my life. It was just I had all these spiritual awakenings and experiences, but I didn't know what to do with them. So shamanism 
shamanism itself is the oldest uh, universal practice known to humankind. Um, it dates back, anthropologists are always fighting about, you know, how far it dates back, but from a lot of the archaeological evidence, it's clear it dates back over 100,000 years. Wow. And so shamanism was practiced all over the world, and I keep saying if you're alive today, you most likely had ancestors who practiced shamanism. And the word shaman itself comes from the Tungus tribe in Siberia, and it translates to one who sees in the dark or healer, and so shamanism was practiced uh, throughout Asia, um, Africa, uh, Northern Europe, uh, North and South America, and a shaman has always been defined as a man or woman who goes into an altered state of consciousness, typically through using some form of percussion, uh, drums, rattles, bells, um, click sticks in Australia, didgeridoo is used in Australia, and through that form of percussion, goes into an altered state of consciousness where his or her free soul steps into what is called non-ordinary reality, the hidden realms in Australia, it's called the dream time. Among the Celtic people, it's, it's called the other world. And in the dream time, in the other world, it's seen that there are helping, compassionate spirits who really care about um, humans and want to help them evolve and heal and live the best life possible. And I, I always feel that we're spirits too. You know, here we are, we're body, mind, but if you take away our body and our mind, we're spirit. But as humans, we're so involved in playing the game. You know, we can't be objective. Where the spirits, they're kind of sitting in the bleachers and they're looking down at the game, and they're saying, oh, put your foot here, go this way. No, don't make that decision. <laughs> um, and so they can really advise us. <clears throat> they can see what's happening for us on a physical or emotional level, an unidentified wound that really needs healing, and they can bring healing. So in old-time shamanism and shamanism, there were one or just a few shamans for the community. And the shaman typically went through some initiatory experience, like a near-death experience, a psychotic break, or an illness, where they had a numinous experience, <clears throat> experiencing unity consciousness, and returned with um, psychic gifts and healing gifts to be able to help the community. I do believe that one of the reasons that shamanism has survived over 100,000 years is its ability to evolve to meet the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And in our culture today, it's no longer, um, uh, it doesn't really work for there to be one shaman in New York, one shaman in Toronto, one shaman in London or wherever. Um, and many people are going through life's initiations that bring them into an expanded state of awareness. And so one of the really beautiful initiations into shamanism today and the evolution of shamanism today is how people are drawn to learning shamanic practices for themselves. It doesn't mean they're going to become a shaman, um, but everybody can learn shamanic practices whether it's shamanic journeying, and also shamanism is a way of life. It's how we live our life. So there are practices that go into uh, living a life of honor, respect, and gratitude. Um, and these are all things that we can integrate into our life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I just love the way that you speak about it. It's, it's so peaceful and so calming. And the way you articulate it, I can almost experience what you're what you're talking about and I've um, also done your uh, programs on a shamanic journeying and I found them to be extremely powerful and um, you know the experiences unless you actually go through it yourself it's hard to put into words but it, it feels just as real as this physical reality if not more real um, right and it's I think also with 
just the changing times where we're at, it's almost, it's a necessity that I think we all should be turning towards or exploring, at least opening ourselves up to the possibilities of um, receiving support from the unseen world. Uh, so if, um, if you could just talk a little bit about if you're not, you know, we can't all become shamans because I'm sure it's a lifelong yeah. journey, but what can we all do to integrate more of that type of um, way of being or a state of being in our daily lives and how can we um, not only benefit ourselves but also serve the community? What are some of right. the ways? Yeah, and there, there are many ways that uh, go into living a shamanic way of life. And what's really important to understand is that shamanic cultures were based on community. Mm -hmm. And for the survival of the community, it was really important for each person to understand that they have an individual, unique gift and strength that they contributed to the entire community to keep it healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons that in shamanic cultures, when a person got ill and a shaman performed a healing for them, everybody showed up for the healing because that person was a vital member of the community. And in today's world, uh, we live um, in a status quo. We just try to get by, and we really don't see the light shining out of people's eyes um, because we've lost a lot of the passion and meaning for life. And so one thing is important for people to do is to reflect, um, put on some music and close your eyes and go within or do some writing or take a walk in nature, or meditate, and to really ask yourself the question, what would bring meaning back into your life again? What would bring passion back into your life again? What do you feel your gifts, we're all contributing gifts, we're all important, we all matter. What do you feel your gift that you're sharing in the world today and in the community? And, and to be willing to acknowledge that is really important. Um, shamanic cultures worked uh, very closely with nature mm -hmm. because it was understood that we're not disconnected from nature, we're part of nature. And in a modern day world, technology is wonderful. You know, we, we're getting to talk. Um, we can turn on the heat when we need heat. We can turn on, some of us can turn on air conditioning if we need it. Uh, we have refrigeration. It's wonderful, but what it's done is it's disconnected us from nature. Mm -hmm. And I really feel strongly that it's our disconnection from nature that's causing so much of the emotional and physical illness that we're seeing today. And I know so many people who have healed themselves by literally just lying on the earth for 15 minutes a day or uh, taking walks in nature, you know, really brings back that feeling of connection. It's healing bomb. It helps you remember that you're connected to everything. From a shamanic point of view, Everything that exists in the world is alive. And where everything is connected to what we call a web of life. Mm -hmm. And whatever you do to one living being, you do to every living being in the web of life. And so, for example, earth, air, water, and fire in shamanism are seen as living beings. The earth gives us life. Air gives us life. We have to breathe in order to live. All, all life depends on water. And the sun gives us life. It's not the electric company. It's the sun <laughs> that gives us the energy to live. And what happens is in, in our modern day world, we pollute. That's that which gives us life. And I think that uh, one of the reasons we're experiencing such extremes in the climate right now you know, if you look around the world, there's either extreme flooding or extreme drought, is it's mirroring back to us our own inner state of disharmony. And I'm not trying to oversimplify what's happening in the environment, but I really feel in every cell of my body that if people would wake up every morning and, number one, give thanks for their lives, 
and give thanks to the earth, air, water, and the sun for giving us what we need to sustain our lives, I believe that we would see more harmony in what we're dealing with on climatic levels right now. You know, it sounds so simple, but it's our disharmony that's really, and our lack of respect, that's really causing so many of the problems. Um, shamanic cultures, um, in shamanic cultures, it's also seen that thoughts are things. Mm -hmm. And so when, um, as human beings, it's very important for us to be able to acknowledge how we're feeling. I am angry at what's going on right now, or I'm in a state of despair. But, and experience that feeling, but don't send the energy out to yourself, to others, or into the world. And so in shamanic cultures, there's a difference between expressing and sending. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the difference in this culture. So I can say I'm very angry about what's going on someplace in the world or in the United States, but I'm going to transform the energy of that anger so that what I'm sending out is love and light. That ends up going to me, it goes to all my loved ones, it goes to others, and it goes out into the world. And so from a shamanic point of view, that's a real way that we can work with transforming what's going on on the planet today. Also, watching our words. Uh, words have power. Are we blessing ourselves and, or, and others, or are we cursing ourselves? and others by the words that we actually state out loud because it's seen that when we speak the energy of vibration goes up to, into the universe and manifests down its form. Most spiritual traditions believe this but it's definitely true in shamanism and learning how to rephrase our thoughts so that we're aligning ourselves with our desired outcome. So if we say we want peace mm -hmm. And we keep on saying we don't believe peace is possible or isn't this terrible what's happening. You know, where's the train of thought going? So we have to learn how to align our thoughts with our desired outcome. And the last thing I wanted to mention, I mean, there's many different ways to work, but these are some very core ways to work. The last thing I wanted to mention is that from a shamanic point of view, this world is a dream. We're dreaming it all into being with our daydreams, our thoughts, and our words. And so many shamans say we're dreaming the wrong dream. And um, we were born with these incredible gift of imagination. And so it's important for us to reflect during the day on our daydreams. And are we actually daydreaming the best world we want for ourselves and for the rest of life? Or are we daydreaming with our chaotic thoughts and words, um, more chaos than a nightmare. And it is our responsibility to really work with our daydreams, again, to be able to dream into being the world that we really want to live in. So those are some real core practices. If people never decide to learn any shamanic journeying, which is a very joyful practice, those just there is living a shamanic way of life. It's beautiful and uh, so interesting as well. I also love the analogy that you uh, provide in, in the shamanic journey about the inner garden and how important it is to um, reflect and, and sort of go back and, and look at it and see what state it's at and also it's almost like gardening, but in inside right. yourself. So, um, what is? It's very hard. These these concepts are so hard to put into words. But what is a soul? How do you understand a soul and the soul's journey? And what is a spirit? And how are they interconnected? And also, how can we tap into? Because a lot of people these days are so disconnected from their essence of who we are, which is spiritual beings clothed in a, in a human body, which is actually, I, I love the way you express that in one of your books. Um, and so how can we, what is a soul, what is a spirit, what is the connection there, and how can we reconnect with that 
essence of who we really are. And um, right. Yeah. Well, um, there there's a few ways that we can look at this. Different spiritual traditions would define soul and spirit in different ways. So I'm going to give my definition of soul and spirit. So when you look up soul in the dictionary, soul is essence. It's mm -hmm. our life force. It's that mm -hmm. part of ourselves that keeps us alive. And so in my worldview, you know, in the worldview of Sandra Engerman, 